You've probably heard that chimpanzees are one of humans' closest relatives. And you may also have heard that we diverged from our common ancestor with chimps about six million years ago. But you may be wondering how we know that chimpanzees are our closest relatives and how we know when we diverged from a common ancestor. Well, in this video on phylogeny, we will be exploring the answers to those questions by tracing evolutionary history. So first, let's start with evidence for evolution. How do we know that different species are related? One main type of evidence for evolution is biogeography. And this is exactly what it sounds like. Biogeography studies the location of different species. For example, if we look at these different species that occupy different islands, you note that species one and two, which are more closely related, are also very close in terms of geography. The idea being that when species evolve, they start by migrating to new areas in which there are new environments that act as selecting pressures. Biogeography also explains some interesting things like why there are polar bears in the Arctic, but penguins in the Antarctic. If the environments are so similar, why aren't there penguins and polar bears on both ends of the poles? Well, the reason is biogeography. Another type of evidence for evolution is fossils. And there are many different types of fossils. Fossils could be trace footprints of these dinosaur tracks, could be a preserved skeleton, could be a replica of part of an organism, or it could be an organism preserved in a special type of material. As you can see from all of these, fossils provide evidence of species that lived in the past that may no longer live today. You'll also note that fossils require unique conditions in order to form. Now the great thing about fossils, besides telling us about things that lived long ago, is that the fossil record will allow us to date different fossils. And we can do this relatively by taking a look at layers of rock. Sedimentary rock is a type of rock in which fossils tend to form, and sedimentary rock forms layers, or strata. And the idea is that the strata, or layers at the bottom, are the oldest, and the strata, or layers at the top, are the youngest. Therefore, fossils found at the bottom are older than fossils found at the top. And then this gives us relative age, which fossils are older versus younger. Note that it doesn't necessarily tell us the relationship between the fossils. We can look at these two fossils and say that these two species existed at the same time, but we don't necessarily know if they're very closely related. We can absolute date fossils as well. Absolute dating means that we can put an actual number on when that species lived. And we do it by looking at radioactive isotopes. All living things have some radioactive versions of their chemicals. Not very much, but enough that allows them to date. So this is how it works. Once an organism dies, the radioactive chemical starts to decay, and it decays at a very constant rate. It takes a certain amount of time for half of the radioactive chemical to decay, and that's known as the half-life. And so if you know the half-life of a chemical, you can measure how much of that chemical is in the fossil and determine its age. And this is known as radiometric dating, analyzing the amount of radioactive isotopes to age a fossil. And often this is done with carbon-14, a radioactive version of carbon. As you can see from this graph, the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,700 years. So every 5,700 years, half of the carbon-14 will disappear. So if we find a fossil that has only one thirty-second of the original amount of carbon-14, we could infer that that fossil is 28,500 years old. To sum up fossil evidence, there's a couple of key strengths. It tells us about species that no longer exist today. It tells us the order those species existed, and it allows us to date them. But keep in mind that not all species become fossils because special conditions are required for fossilization. The strata can be disturbed, which affects how we document the sequence of life forms. 
And also, fossils don't necessarily show us which groups are more related than others. In order to answer that question, we need to look at morphology, which is also known as comparative anatomy. Morphology is simply the study of organisms' structures. And one structure that we know well are homologous structures. If you look at the limbs of these four different animals, you'll see that internally the structure is quite similar. All four of these animals has a humerus in purple, a radius in orange, an ulna, the tan color, and so on and so forth. Now, these structures have become adapted to different functions due to different environments, but the fact that the structure fundamentally is similar shows us evidence of common ancestry due to divergent evolution. Similarly, vestigial structures, as shown here, these tiny little leg bones in a snake are vestigial, the tiny hip bones in a whale are vestigial, and the tailbone of a human is vestigial. All these things are small in size and reduced in function. They don't really serve a purpose anymore, but they do tell us that these organisms likely had a common ancestor that did have these structures. So we evolved from some sort of species that did have a tail, or we share a common ancestor with the species that had a tail. So again, we see the common ancestry. One last way of looking at morphology is embryology. Embryos are very early stage developing organisms. If you compare the embryo of a chicken with the embryo of a human, you'll see a lot of similarities. And this again provides us evidence of common ancestry. And just as a little test, you can see that we resemble not just chick embryos, but many other animals. So here we have embryos very early on in development, a little bit later, a little bit later, and then you can see from this stage what each embryo is likely to become. Because humans and rabbits are very similar in terms of their embryological development, we could infer that we have a recent common ancestor, a more recent common ancestor with them than we do with fish or salamanders. So this evidence is pretty awesome because it tells us about common ancestry, but we have to be careful not com to confuse homologous structures with analogous structures. Analogous structures show convergent evolution, not divergent evolution. And here's what I mean. A bat wing and a bird wing are homologous because their underlying structure is similar. And so this shows that they diverged at some point from a common ancestor. But if you compare a bird wing to an insect wing, you might think that those are homologous, but you would be wrong because their underlying structure is very different. An insect wing is made up of entirely different materials than a bird wing. All this shows is convergent evolution, that they had similar environmental constraints, but it doesn't show that they have a common ancestor. So you have to be very careful to look for homologous versus analogous structures. And sometimes, Molecular biology can provide the evidence we need in case homologous structures are giving us some confusing conclusions. In molecular biology, the two main molecules that are used as evidence are proteins and DNA. Here you can see that the amino acid sequences in human hemoglobin is being compared to several other species. Based on the fact that there's only one difference in amino acid between our hemoglobin and a gorilla's hemoglobin, we can infer that we have a very recent common ancestor with the gorilla, and that we're more closely related to gorillas than we are to, say, frogs, whose hemoglobin is 67 amino acids different from us. Similarly, we could compare DNA. Humans and chimpanzees share 98% of their DNA, which suggests very recent common ancestor. Whereas we only share 47% of our DNA with lemurs, so they're not quite as closely related to us. So these are the two main types of molecular evidence, and again, the similarities suggest common ancestry. Strengths here are similar to that of morphological evidence. They show divergence from the common ancestor, and it can be more precise and accurate than just looking at the morphology, the structures of an organism. However, keep in mind that if you're going to compare the DNA of different organisms, you first got to have the DNA samples and you have to sequence them.
So now that we know the evidence that shows relationships among organisms, how do we use that evidence to construct phylogenetic trees or cladograms? So here's a phylogenetic tree, and all this does is it shows the evolutionary history of different groups of organisms. Here we've got group A, B, C, D, and E. An important thing to remember is that time is always implied in these diagrams, even if it's not shown. So these organisms lived a long time ago. These organisms are present day. So A, B, and C exist today, whereas D and E have gone extinct because they're not at the end of the timeline. Something else we can infer from this diagram is that species D is the most recent common ancestor of A and B. Now species E is also a common ancestor of B and A, but E exists far longer ago. So D is the most recent one. We can also infer from this that A and B are more closely related because they share a more recent common ancestor than A and C. A and C diverged, say, 20,000 years ago, whereas A and B diverged maybe 10,000 years ago. So how do we build these trees? Well, we use homologies that we talked about a few minutes ago. Each of these purple hatch marks indicates a homology, which you might also see called a derived character. This means a, a characteristic that developed at some point during the evolution of organisms. So the amniotic egg is a derived character, or a homology, shared by all of these species that evolved after the appearance of this characteristic. Tetrapod limbs is another derived character, but this is shared by amphibians, mammals, lizards, snakes, crocodiles, ostriches, and hawks and birds. So depending on the number of homologies, we can group organisms together based on their relationships. Here we see that ostriches, hawks, and other birds are the only groups to share this particular derived character, feathers. If we want even more specific information about how to draw the trees, we can use molecular evidence such as DNA. If we know that humans and chimpanzees are 98% similar, followed by gibbons and with lemurs as a distant follower, we can construct a tree that shows this relationship. Chimpanzees and humans have a very recent common ancestor, whereas lemurs and humans with their 47% commonality have a more distant common ancestor, almost 60 million years ago, in fact. As we construct these trees, which we're going to do in class, it's important to keep in mind the principle of parsimony. If we look at these mythical rodent-like organisms, here is the ancestor rodent. It has scales, it has a tail, and it has five toes. One, two, three, four, five. These are three current species that are thought to have evolved from this ancestral species. The question is, how would we draw our tree? Which would be most closely related? Well, there's a couple ways we could draw the tree. The tree might look like this. Here's our ancestor. Here's our three modern-day species. According to this diagram, three major evolutionary events occurred. In one species, scales were lost and that's how we got species one. And then, at a certain, another point, the tail was lost, and that derived character is found in both two and three. And then a third event occurred right here where the fifth toe was lost, making species three characteristics. We could also arrange them this way, and if you look at this tree, you'll see that one, two, three, four major evolutionary events occurred. Now, which is more likely to have happened? Probably this one. The principle of parsimony basically states that the simplest explanation is usually the correct explanation. We want to make trees that show the fewest number of changes. Could this have happened? Yes, but it's far less likely that four different evolutionary events occurred compared to these three. And one last thing about phylogenetic trees. Anytime you have a group of organisms and their common ancestor, we call this a monophyletic group or a monophyletic taxon. It's simply a group of different species 
that include the ancestral species, in this case B, and all of the descendant species. And that concludes our review of evidence for evolution and how to trace phylogeny. In class, we'll be looking at a few different case studies and we'll be using different types of evidence to evaluate and to build our own phylogenetic trees. Don't forget to take your poll before you come into class.